Everyone here, uh, welcome. My name is Chris Lewis. I'm the President and CEO of Public Knowledge, and welcome to this year's Emerging Tech event. We're so glad to see you all. Um, how many folks here uh, have been to an Emerging Tech event before? Raise your hand. All right. A lot of new people. That's good. No, no, really, because uh, Emerging Tech is something that we've been doing at Public Knowledge uh, since 2011. And it's different, it's evolved over time, uh, but we want to continue to see new people here, new voices, uh, because at its core, it, it, it is a part of public knowledge's work. Uh, if you don't know public knowledge, we are a, a public interest nonprofit here in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and we promote uh, free expression, an open internet, uh, and affordable access to creative tools, uh, creative works, and, and communications tools. And, and for us, part of that, as technology innovates uh, and new uh, systems and technologies come out, uh, we want to make sure that they are working in the public interest. Um, our very first event came on the heels of a paper that our, our old colleague, who's uh, not with the organization anymore, Michael Weinberg, wrote in 2010. Uh, he, he wrote a little paper entitled, uh, It Will Be Awesome If They Don't Screw It Up. Um, yeah, true, true title. And uh, he was writing a paper about uh, what was then an exciting new technology called 3D printing. And it led to 2011, uh, an event called 3D DC. And for a few years, we did this event just about that emerging technology. Uh, the technology keeps on going. Um, innovation keeps happening. And so over the years, we, we transitioned it to emerging tech. Uh, with that same concept in mind, it's like, how do we make sure that we get the benefits uh, of these amazing new technologies, and how do we also think about uh, you know, the unintended consequences or other market dynamics or things that come with it that need to be checked and fixed, uh, and how we strike that balance. Um, in other words, how do we not screw it up? And at Public Knowledge, we think about doing that by uh, making sure that we build technology and we govern technology and yes, we even regulate technology uh, based on public interest values. Uh, values uh, that we've been working on for 23 years, like openness and access to knowledge. Uh, values like free expression and making sure that, that all voices, uh, even uh, the smallest, uh, most minority opinions can be heard. Um, uh, values like equity. Um, you know, a lot of our work, we talk about equity, we talk about localism, we talk about folks being able to use the technology to build community. Um, <clears throat> And that's a powerful thing uh, in our country. Uh, and over the years, we have started talking more about other values that are important to balance against those things like safety. Uh, products are designed in ways that are safe, uh, that uh, conversations on social media uh, are safe, and how do you balance that with that value of free expression? It's an important thing to get right. Uh, privacy, certainly, control of your data, uh, uh, competition, consumer choice. Uh, making sure that smaller players can innovate as well and that, and that uh, uh, folks who are using technology can find uh, those new innovations that are happening outside of the big companies. And all of those values, I think, uh, are supported by the fact that we have a country that uh, has uh, democratic systems, uh, democratic ethos, uh, and, and supports a society where those values can live and people feel free to express themselves but also to um, those are public interest values. This is why we do our work, and we're so glad you're here with us today, because emerging technology is about being here in the Capitol Visitor Center on Capitol Hill, uh, uh, having, uh, I know I've already met some congressional staff who are here, uh, and bringing them together with folks who are building technology, bringing them together with folks who are thinking and writing about technology and public interest values, uh, and making sure that in Washington, uh, hopefully, 365 days a year, but definitely today, and in Washington, <clears throat> policymakers are thinking about how they can balance these values as they make policy and make sure that we can, uh, can have nice things uh, when it comes to new technology. Um, so today, we're going to have a great day. We've got a full day of speakers and, and panels, uh, and then this evening, I hope you guys stick around all day. Uh, because uh, for those of you who are here in person, uh, we also do a fun exhibition in the evening where you get to tie
touch and talk about and learn about uh, all of the technology from who are friends in the industry who uh, want to be here and want to be a part of the conversation about that balance and demonstrate how the technology is trying to strike that balance. So, um, uh, emerging technology, like I said, started with 3D printing. Today, we're going to focus on three types of technology. Number one, uh, right after I finish, we're going to have our first panel talking about decentralized web technologies. And for me, uh, decentralized web is, is back again. That's how the internet started. Uh, the idea that uh, power is abuse, and we're building platforms, and we're building protocols that allow uh, all different types of things to happen, and the power is not concentrated with one company. Um, and that's coming back, we can talk about that. Number two, we want to talk about uh, the exciting space of virtual reality, or as some of our friends call it, XR, um, extended reality, or anything that is living in a digital space. Uh, some people call it the metaverse, but it's growing and it's 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 still developing, and we want to make sure that those public interest values are respected in it, and it's built in a way that we nice things. And lastly, yes, we are here. I don't know if I can take a drink when this is. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence. <laughs> Um, probably the hottest emerging technology that people want to talk about across the country. Uh, we'll definitely be talking about it here and starting that out. So it should be a good day of talking about where Web 3.0, as we call it, is moving. Uh, a few logistics, and then we'll bring up our uh, our first group of speakers. Um, but uh, as I said, we've got folks in the room. Folks will be coming and going. There's bad things up in the hallway. Uh, uh, we'll have lunch. Uh, so please uh, respect the rules of the Capitol building. Uh, they're asking us not to bring food in here, so uh, please be very careful with what you're doing uh, in the auditorium. Um, like I said, what we'll panels talks, what we'll Q&A. And so if you see public knowledge folks walking around with these pins on, uh, or they might be identified uh, during or before panels start, uh, they will be here to help with Q&A. There'll be some cards that can be passed around and folks want to ask questions of our amazing speakers. Um, and so look for those opportunities. Um, for our folks who are online, we're really lucky that uh, I believe see Stan is here recording this. And uh, so you can check that out later. You can share with your friends, or you can share this video uh, when we post it later on on the Public Knowledge YouTube channel. So if you aren't subscribed to the PK uh, YouTube channel, please do that. Um, but yeah, uh, C-SPAN is recording, we're grateful for them coming and covering this. Uh, it's an exciting thing for society. Uh, we want more folks to hear about these conversations. And social media is going. So follow Public Knowledge on Instagram, on Twitter, X, uh, funny X, sorry. Um, we're on there, we're on Instagram, we're on Blue Sky, um, which is a decentralized web technology. We love Blue Sky. Um, and follow the conversation there, and you can see some of the posts and hopefully we can hear some of your thoughts and, and ideas as we keep things going throughout the year. Uh, I think the hashtag is hashtag Emerging Tech 2024, if you want to join the conversation. Um, special shout out to three people uh, who are making this day go. You'll see two of them on stage for sure. Um, our moderator for the next panel, uh, one of our lead folks of public knowledge, Nick Garcia, is the leader of organizing this event. Uh, along with Lisa McPherson, our policy director, you'll see her on stage later. Um, and then behind the scenes, uh, the woman who makes it all happen with our events, Michelle and Body Yang. Uh, those of you in the room see her floating around. Uh, thank you, Michelle. She's doing a lot of work for this event, so thank you guys for making this happen. Okay, we're going to kick things off uh, with our very first panel. I'm going to invite the panelists to come on out, moderated by our own. Uh, Policy Council, uh, Nick Garcia, we're going to be talking about decentralized web. So, thank you for questions. All right, thank you for your questions. And uh, Nick's going to take away from here. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Um, as Chris said, I'm Nick Garcia. I'm a policy counsel here at Public Knowledge. I work on our emerging technologies portfolio. And uh, as Chris said, this is going to be our first panel of the day. It's on decentralized web technology. Uh, you should have all gotten some cards when you showed up here for check-in today. So um, at about 10 minutes, with about 10 minutes left of our discussion, there'll be someone coming around to collect questions. So 
Um, as we're having our discussion here today, think of what uh, maybe you want to ask these wonderful folks here and uh, put some questions down. And we'll, we'll be able to uh, do that. Um, so I'm going to get right into it and kick off because uh, these are the folks that we want to hear from. I'm just here to facilitate this discussion. Um, and in recent years, the conversation about technology has been increasingly dominated by discussions about big tech, uh, more recently by artificial intelligence. Uh, but what we're focusing on here in this first panel is decentralized web technologies, and, and that's for a reason. And that's because this is a, a set of technologies that has a potential for some of these solutions to that consolidation and centralization that exists that we're struggling with. Uh, so I'm joined here by this amazing panel of folks, each are thinking about different versions of decentralized and distributed technologies, and I'm going to just run through introducing these folks for a bit, we're going to have a conversation, um, and then we'll get to that Q&A section. So first up here we have Richard Reisman. Uh, Richard Reisman is a senior fellow at the Foundation for American Innovation, um, and a frequent contributor to Tech Policy Press. He's been dealing with the distributed network services uh, for many decades, and blogs on human-centered digital services and related tech policy at his amazing website, smartlyintertwingled.com. Uh, he has uh, managed and consulted for businesses of all sizes, he's developed pioneering online services, and holds over 50 media tech patents licensed by over 200 companies to serve billions of users, and one of our favorites here at Public Colleges, but these are all now in the public domain. Um, so he has an AP in Applied Math from Brown University and an MS in Operations Research from Lehigh University. We're very happy to have him here with us today. We also have Mary Camacho, who is the Executive Director and CEO of Hall of Chain. Uh, Mary is based in Gibraltar, but uh, is the, um, here joining us with a, a Master's Degree in Social Science at the University of Chicago as her academic background, but has over 20 years of leadership in technology and telecom. She's promoted business ethics and advised numerous startups on strategy, on funding, and product development. And at Holochain, Mary is driving the launch of innovative technology designed for large-scale coordination and solving global challenges. And finally, we have Rachel Greenhorn, uh, who is the head of marketing and communications at the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, in this role, she focuses on fostering and growing the Filecoin community and promoting the growth of Web3. She joined the foundation from Protocol Labs, which is an open source research development and deployment laboratory whose projects include IPFS and Filecoin, among others. Uh, Rachel transitioned to the Web3 space after more than a decade in media, tech, and finance, and most recently was a senior director of strategic communications for CTA, the Consumer Technology Association. So join me in welcoming these great folks that we have for the panel here. Um, So, um, as I said, we have uh, all of this interesting, you know, uh, potential takes on decentralized web technology. And Richard, I want to start with you. You've been strategizing and thinking about distributed systems for decades now. And I'm hoping that you could just give us a high-level overview first of this kind of technology space. Sure. Um, am I, do I need to be closer? Is, it, is this good? Thanks. So, yeah, I, I got involved in distributed systems pretty much on the term originated, um, and so stepping back, I, I, I'm calling this sort of the Dow of distribution because the, the, you know, you probably know the Dow symbol on the bottom left there, which is signifying how opposites blend and contain one another. Things are non-binary, it's really a both-and situation, and it's originally it's yin and yang, love and strife, male and female, all of those opposites. But in systems, you have this pendulum that swings from centralized to decentralized and recentralizing. In the 70s, it was many computers. But it, um, it also ties to democracy and questions of chaos versus tyranny uh, and you know, how we make progress and how we make combination. So in my migration from mainframes to smartphones and beyond, issue with centralized mainframes, uh, which filled up all rooms, almost you know, half the size of this room, sometimes as big as this room. Got mini computers, uh, PCs, all of that changed, but there was a swing to many, many some people said it should be decentralized, Citibank was, everything was on mini computers, but then they, people started to realize that it, that doesn't work either, that they're disadvantaged. So that led to the rise of what a lot of people call distributed 
computer systems that are hybrids. Um, we've got this end-to-end -end principle peer-to-peer, -peer, but it gets overlaid by application-specific hierarchies. So the, the real idea is to be flexible. You can have many centers or none, depending on the function and context. Uh, it supports mixtures of both top-down control and bottom-up control, depending on the context. Uh, there's this idea of federation that's the big thing. So, uh, Mary, I'd love to go over to you and to go from, like, Richard, there was a really interesting overview of, like, a high level, all the different ways in which we can have distribution. But I'd love to go from that general down to the specifics. So, Holochain has developed an open source protocol for building peer-to-peer -peer distributed networks. Um, what, in your view, are the problems created by having fully centralized technology? And then, what are the like, why is collaboratively managed standards like polishing and, and open protocols like that a, a solution to those problems? Okay, well, um, maybe I'll take a little step back and talk a, a little bit about what we're doing and how it's distinct even from some of the things that Dick was describing. So, um, so Holochain is a peer to peer application framework. So, it's infrastructure for building applications. And that's different than some of the other types of things you would have heard about, like blockchains, where everything runs on a blockchain, essentially, and everybody is writing apps, and all the apps sort of post out who use the blockchain infrastructure for the, the, the running of their applications. In Holochain, every application is its own network. So every application sits apart, sits apart from the current internet. They're not automatically, you can't just go out to a, to a web browser and access it it if you find it, install it, and then you can join the network as a node, as a user. It's a very different like, like approach, and you come into it a little bit differently. Now, the thing is, is to get a little bit to what you were asking about, when, when Holochain was architected, it was looking at how does the world work? How do ecosystems work? How does the natural living world work? Well, it, there's a lot of resilience in it. But there's also a lot of chaos, like you were saying. And that thing, different things exist and can go wrong. And basically what happens is that each thing has agency and each thing is doing its own piece. And they build flows and they build interactions. And then things come to levels of stasis or stability and interaction. So Holochain was sort of modeled on some of that type of biomimicry, um, the way natural systems work. And the idea was that you do start at the beginning agents taking an action. So all, all action or all, um, I can call them transactions, but all things that you do, whether it's a chat or whether it's a financial transaction or whether it's anything starts with a person taking an action. So it's person, verb, and then there is something that exists. And that thing exists in the context of the network that you join. So the thing is, is that you, when, when this stuff is happening, the assumption right now is that everything has to be centralized. We don't even think about it. I mean, I really want to say that that is the baseline. Because while we've all been knowing about distributed technologies, if somebody talks about data, we don't think about data all over. We think about data in a database. And a database, by most of our understanding, design default, is centralized. We, out here, put data in there, and somebody else controls that data. And that is one of the fundamental things that we thought needed to be transformed. So in Holochain, I write data 
to my chain. It's valid because I wrote it to my chain. I don't need anything else to, as a starting point for that to be valid. Then I put it into a distributed space, a distributed hash table. And there, it does get validated because there it becomes a social piece of data, something that has to be validated in order for you <laughs> to believe it or you to accept it or to say, yes, this, is, this meets the rules of the game we're playing, the game being a chat application, the game being the game, the game being a financial transaction. We're all just playing games with following sets of rules. And in Holochain, the application is the shared set of rules. And then everything else is just about, well, how do we make this interactive? How do we make this work with other protocols? How do we make this work with other applications? So step me back to the question if you want me to answer something <laughs> differently, because I know I went all over the map there. So, um, no, that's an amazing overview and, and the, the kind of philosophy behind Holochain as well. I feel like there's a like, great dose of philosophy on this panel so far, but both the, the down of that and the biomimicry of, of Holochain. Um, so, um, what I'm super curious is about what the like risks are created by centralized technology, right? And because that's to me like what we're trying to get at with, with why do we want to go through this whole process of doing decentralization. So what are those risks and then like how do we solve for that? Well, I think uh, there's, there's so many, and I, I don't think we can even get into all of them, but I'll just give one crazy little use case that uh, I was talking to somebody about recently. Um, and, it, and it's about something as, well, it's not mundane, it's important, it's, it's a big issue. It's about the storage of real-world um, waste, uh, nuclear waste. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but we, it's really, the, there's this thing that happens when it, people are doing the containers for nuclear waste, which is that you need to know where they are. We don't need to know where they are tomorrow, uh, just tomorrow or just next week. We need to know where they are for a long time. And the problem is that people have done different types of technologies to sort of store information about where things have been placed in the world. And guess what? If they're in a centralized database, that's not very resilient because people are known to delete centralized databases because one person can delete all the data. When you move things into a more distributed system that has more transparency where it actually can live, not just in one place and not necessarily even replicated all the same everywhere, but truly distributed, there is a guarantee, like the, the chaos aspect of it actually guarantees the resilience of it. We need to have more resilient systems. This is actually a use case that was built out on a distributed system precisely because they had had problems where they had lost data in the past because it had to be deleted. This is a real problem. Now, there's so, so many other social issues that we're dealing with right now. There's issues with everybody trying to be speaking in one space online. That is a massive problem. We're not very nice to one another when we speak online in one space. And part of it is, is we have no control about the spaces online. So digital space is just another layer of our lives. It's not some other thing, right? I have a living room in my house, and I can have living rooms in a digital world. But right now, my living room in a digital world is, is managed by a centralized platform, and that's inappropriate. It's unnecessary. I don't need everybody to see everything or hear everything in my, my living room. But I do need spaces that can be that living room that are digital, and those should be ones that I have more access, agency, and control over. So that's one aspect of what it can, can create. There's, I'll be messed up, taking up a little too much air. No, you're doing great, and, and you've given us like excellent um, transition points for me to bring Rachel into the conversation here. So, um, Rachel, Final Point has a, another approach and, and deals with some of the exact same challenges that, that Mary was talking about. So I'd love to hear from you a bit about uh, what you see as the risks of centralization and the problems there, and then also how Filecoin is like a solution to space. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me here today. Thanks to Chris for putting this together. Mary, everything you just said is like music to my ears. Um, I'm based here in DC, and this is a real like a traditional tech world that I'm in, and I think that I'm talking about the benefits of decentralized web all the time to an audience of big tech companies. And it sometimes falls on deaf ears. So <laughs> this room makes me really happy. So uh, Filecoin is a decentralized storage network. Uh, and the mission of the Filecoin network is to preserve humanity's most important information. So 
what does that mean? Because that means different things to different people. So um, one thing you can think about is like languages, right? So there was a study that was put out that in the next 100 years, 90% of the world's languages are going to disappear. And when a language disappears, you lose a culture, you lose a history, you lose storytelling. And you know, we, have, it's tough, we really need to think about how we are going to preserve these records. Um, another example is um, uh, you know, legal, uh, scientific records. So a lot of scientific data is published online. And a survey came out in 2016 that looked at you know, thousands of scientific research reports online. And when they clicked on the links, all of the links were broken because of link rot. Or the New York Times, when you go through archives of the New York Times and you click on links in the New York Times, many of those lead to dead links. So this is a real problem. We think about how we are going to preserve cultural artifacts. Uh, I have a wonderful friend who is a librarian at the Smithsonian. We were having drinks this week, and uh, I was asking her, like, what are the things that keep you up at night? She said, fire and water. Like, those are the things that could destroy the Smithsonian libraries, fire and water. Fire, you really lose those archives. Water, you can sort of sometimes recreate and preserve, and there are ways to dry out books. But, so the first step is digitizing all of this data. But then we, then we are, in this current world, pulled into big tech companies. So um, the majority of our lives today are lived through just a handful of tech companies. And we talk about that a lot, but like, what does that really mean? Um, a couple of years ago, Facebook went down for four hours, and you think, who cares? You can, we can all live our lives without Facebook for a couple hours, or some of us can live it, we think, forever. But you don't realize all the things that are tied into Facebook. So WhatsApp, Instagram, people's um, you know, like authentication paths to other apps that they use. Some people use Facebook for payments. All of that was shut down. And I thought one of the funniest things was like the actual people who worked at Facebook, when they went to like scan into their office buildings, their badges didn't work because the entire system was shut down. Single points of failure. Um, we don't think about that. We don't think about what it means when the majority of our lives are run through a couple companies. So now we're going to talk about data storage, which is kind of a, not the most exciting topic in theory. But you know, there are like three companies, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, that dominate the storage market. Like 80% of storage is housed by three companies. And um, you know. Typically, companies will pay to store maybe three copies of their data with those, with those companies. That can, you know, one person makes a mistake. Google Cloud last, two weeks ago in Australia, they accidentally erased an entire um, company's Google Cloud archives. This was a retirement company. They ran all the retirement accounts for all the public, the teachers and university uh, uh, professors in Australia. Oops, we accidentally erased it. So I mean, it's the benefit of it. So now let's talk about what the benefits of decentralization. So CloudPoint is this decentralized storage network. There is no central company in the middle. Anyone can join as a storage provider, and there are about 2,500 of these around the world. And anyone can sign up to be a storage client. So you're saying, you know, I don't really want to give my troves of important data to one of these three companies. I want to chop it up. I want to preserve it on the decentralized web. I want to store many, many copies of it across this network of storage providers, and it creates redundancy, it creates resiliency, as you were saying, Mary, um, and it's just this more secure way to store and preserve our, our data sets. Um, it's also, um, you know, it can be more competitive on the price side, because different storage providers can choose to set their prices. And where does the blockchain come in? Well, there, the whole point is there is no company at the core. There is no Amazon or Google in the middle that is uh, confirming that transactions happen. It's all trustless. Um, and that's where there's a blockchain that has uh, two proof mechanisms. One is called proof of space time. Another is a proof of storage, where the, the technology is constantly proving that the data is being stored over time. And if a storage provider decides, you know what, I don't want to be in this game anymore. I'm going to go get Bitcoin money or go do something else, and shuts down their servers, they get penalized. It's called slashing in crypto terms. So there's this incentive mechanism for people to stay on the network and store your files and in exchange the earn file coin. And if they decide to give up on it, they are penalized. So there's the reason why they stick around. And you can store many, many copies of your data. You are not beholden to these big tech companies. So we're really excited about this. There's you know many, you know, you know, the amount of data that is being stored on the network right now could hold the entire Library of Congress multiple times over. Uh, 
Uh, we're working with a lot of universities. We're working with uh, the government of Aruba to store their data sets on, on the Bowboy network. So the foundation exists to help work with these organizations to build the network. We don't own the network. We don't run the network. You don't come to us when you um, are going to store data. We're just here to help uh, make those connections between storage clients and storage providers and help the network grow and flourish. Um, I want to, talking about decentralized storage um, solves for some of the things that Mary was talking about, but she also brought up some of these other challenges that I want to come back to you, Richard, on, because um, so much of what your work has increasingly been focused on was is the, the failings of centralized social media and uh, polarization, um, speech, content moderation, and, and how these things are difficult. And, and Mary mentioned this as like, in our digital spaces, we're not always kind to each other. And like, what are the solutions you know, for some of these problems? And you have a, a different kind of technology that you've talked about that I find particularly fascinating in terms of distributed terms called uh, middleware. So I was hoping that you could talk to us about you know, what is social media middleware and, and tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, so the, the basic problem that is pretty well known, I think, by now that we've got these centralized platforms controlling what you see uh, on the internet, pretty much. Um, and there are issues of moderating speech, and it's really an intractable problem uh, because people are just too diverse, the communities are too different, different norms, all of that stuff. So to, to understand why middleware matters, which I'll, I'll explain what it is in a moment, but that chart in the middle uh, is sort of, I think, the key to understanding this, that we think of you know, we think, and we talk about freedom of expression, but that's only part of the cycle, that it goes through a social mediation ecosystem, which is all the communities, the publishers, the organizations, churches, taverns, you name it. Uh, and then it comes back to you based on who you associate with. So you have impression that comes back, and then you keep cycling through impression and thought. And what all this focus on expression is missing the fact that we had freedom of impression because we decided what communities to participate in and who to listen to. Um, and we had this social mediation ecosystem that helped us formulate what was important. Uh, and with social media right now, we don't have that. It's just the platforms doing that. And the closest thing is likes and shares from the mob is the social mediation. So the idea is, and this goes back to the McLuhan idea that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us, and society is getting broken up and losing context until the context collapse. Middleware is an inter interoperation technology, just like the APIs and protocols, and it uses them to sit between users and the platform to control what they see in the feeds, what's recommended to them so that it's a way to enable freedom of impression. And the core of it, most of the focus on middleware so far has been on user agency and choice uh, as the way that society has always worked. Free speech works because we have freedom of impression that determines do we have to listen to the idiot that's ranting off somewhere or do we just walk away? Uh, and do they get shunned by the community and maybe they moderate? themselves, self-moderation. So that's sort of the technology that a lot of people are starting to think of very seriously. Um, it, and it's interesting, Section 230 is talked about a lot, but the preamble uh, says it's the policy of the United States to encourage the development of technologies which maximize user control over what information is received by individuals who use the internet. And uh, Ethan Zuckerman recently did a lawsuit drawing on that part of Section 230 against the platforms. So, and this gets to Steve Jobs talked about bicycles for the mind. If the internet is becoming a bicycle for the mind, we need to be able to steer it and change the gears and change our lenses for how we view it. It shouldn't be platforms or government that control it. So that's sort of the key idea. And there's actually some, some legislation. The Senate proposed an access the Access Act, which provided a right of delegation where you could tell the platforms that you wanted to delegate the service 
to manage your feed and your recommendations. Um, that hasn't been passed yet, but that's important. The DMA in, in, in Europe has got elements of this, and there's a bill in the New York Senate that's pending that also has goes even deeper into it. So I can talk some more about some more advanced things. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm going to give you one more follow-up, and then I'm going to do something for the whole uh, panel. But I do want to remind people that if you have questions, we're going to have some time for Q&A. So be sure to write those down, and someone will be coming around to grab cards uh, shortly about that. Um, so build, building off of what you're talking about there in terms of um, bicycles for the mind and this kind of broadened scope of um, the, the scope of like social media mid middleware, um, I'm wondering if you could talk more about how the goal is to like restore this um, kind of traditional balance that you talked about in, in social media landscapes um, that tug, nudge people like back towards this like middle ground in terms of how speech comes about. Yeah, yeah. So this I think is just emerging. And, oh, by the way, there's a you know, if, if you want more detail, that the QR will lead you to a lot more on this. But uh, so I think it was back in November that it hit me that a lot of things that people have been talking about that I've been talking about boil down to what I'm now calling three pillars uh, for human discourse. And that's the picture to the right, with the idea that you've got the platforms down at the bottom, which are the underlying infrastructure for how social media works. And it also applies to other things like Amazon's you know, commerce network, Google search, all of that stuff. But especially uh, in social media. So on the left is user agency, which is the thing that was the initial driver for middleware. Uh, and it dates back to Mike Masnick did protocols on platforms uh, like five years ago, sorry, some earlier work. Uh, Francis Fukuyama and the Stanford group uh, really focused on middleware as a way to control platform power. But so that's all focused on agency. And what has been forgotten is the social media ecosystem, which has been decaying because the old organizations don't have a meaningful role in social media now. Uh, it's, it's supported the way it needs to be supported. Um, and then, so that's the other pillar that's important. And then reputation and trust. There have been primitive reputation systems. Reddit has one. Slashdot had a thing called Karma. Uh, and if you understand how Google works, the original PageRank algorithm is really a reputation system. It develops reputations for web pages, and it's, it uses a lot of complicated calculations. But it's not it's not AI, and it's not really the algorithm. It's the human intelligence of webmasters in the old days. And anybody who puts a link on a page anywhere, and they study the link structure, and they say who likes this page, and therefore it gives it some positive reputation, and then they go back and do they have a good reputation? And so there's this idea that's called eigentrust, because it's a very complex matrix um, computation that figures out who can be trusted based on who trusts them. So there's no central authority for trust necessarily. It's just the communities that build up trust. So this idea of the, the pillars is you need all three of them, and they work together. The agency is what gives legitimacy to the social mediation. And reputation is what sort of fits between them and figures, OK, who do I listen to? Which organizations and associations do I want to make because they have a good reputation? And so all of this stuff fits together. And so what we need, I think, is to build this, use middleware as the enabling layer that enables all of these pieces to fit together in flexible ways that are going to vary from community to community. Um, and from context to context, when I say bicycle to the mind, you want know, to be able to change, you know, if I want to study something and go into this kind of a lens, then I want to lean back and relax and have a different kind of lens, I want to look at cat pictures, um, you know, whatever it is, you want to be able to change your filter uh, at the time. Um, but you still want to have things that alert you, you know, when you need to be alerted, wherever you have your interests. Well, I, I can see that Mary has a, a thought about like this kind of trust and reputation idea when it it's actually not that. It's it's that these are you know all of the things that we talk about. When we're talking about distributed technologies. 
might be important, but at the end of the day, adoption of these things is, is really critical. And I think we're not having the hard conversation, which is what's in the way of it is that the system by which social media works is money. It's the system is about advertising and money. We cannot solve that system with new technology. That is the part we have to be balancing this with policy. We have to be balancing how are we structured as a society to allow businesses, five businesses in the world, to control this much of what we do online. It's inappropriate. It shouldn't be. And we need some support from a policy and political perspective in order to enable other tech, other types of technology to come into play. Because there's no compete. There's no, the field for competition is not really there. So I love what you're talking about, what we're talking about, what you're talking about, and it's not going to happen in terms of real adoption unless we do some other changes. Because the, 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 they're incentivized. What you were describing about how the, the algorithms work, yeah, that was, might have been how it worked at the beginning of the platform days. It's not how it works today. Today, we're incented to put things up there that actually have us disagree and argue and make, you know, the, whoever can put the most annoying thing or, you know, uh, objectified thing, essentially, will get the most hits. And then you just get more and more of the same. Those things are not visible to any of us. Those things are not... Uh, I know you're talking about making them visible, but even then, we've seen in every UX study you, you, that's out there, people are not going to take the time to make all of those choices. I'm creating technology that's all about agency, and yet most people don't want the level of agency that we're talking about. So we have to also deal with not having these things be okay in the way that it's structured here in the United States, and, and actually it's having a global impact because most of these big tech companies are US companies, and maybe that sounds great, but really, it's putting a lot of weird pressures internationally and globally as well for us to be having those companies source all of the data and all of the conversations around the world. And I will just add to that, smart policies, yes, and like clear frameworks that work. But also, we need technology that is incredibly easy to use, right? right? Because the reason we're all using Google and Facebook and Amazon is because it is one click all of our data is saved. We're willing to cede that information to these companies in exchange for ease of use. We don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so one of the things I'm really invested in is like finding teams and companies to build tools on Filepoint. Filepoint is a framework. Filepoint is a framework. But we need teams that are going to be out there building creative tools on top that make it as easy to use. You know, there's a there's a decentralized video alternative to Zoom, right? Somebody needs to build that so that it's just as easy to use that as it is to use Zoom and give your information to them. Right, and that gets off the back of funding because what have we done? We've let all the funding for this, a lot of this innovation happen in the public and the private sector. And even when it was being funded with public dollars and universities, it still all ended up in private um, hands and making them the ones that could make the money off of it, which is inappropriate because now we're having it used in a public context so often. So I think we really need to do a little bit of kind of looking at this systemically and holistically to, to really shift things. So, yeah, so I, I think that that's sort of an interesting angle because, you know, they, they talk about the original sin of the internet is the advertising model, and the platforms have exploited that and it's basically an, an attention allocation game, and they're making money off our attention and our data. So there's been talk of regulating that specifically, but I think this is an area where middleware is, is relevant because the earliest discussions of a form of middleware were actually in the 1990s. Uh, John Hegel did a paper in HBR and also wrote a book with two different co-authors about the idea of infomediaries. And the idea is that you entrust your data to these infomediaries, and then they negotiate with businesses over what advertising you're willing to put, give your attention to and what data you're willing to give them. And middleware is basically a way to enable intermediaries to manage your attention, your data, and all of these things. Uh, and so you, you change the negotiation from just, you know, a, a shrink wrap contract that says, I'm going to pepper you with advertising and take all your data and give you free service 
to negotiating that, well, maybe I'll let you do some ads if I control what kind of ads for what things and how intrusive, and I control what data you get and how you use it. Um, and so that's the other side of middleware. And that changes the economics of the platform so that they could potentially still get, use advertising to generate some revenue, but with a different social contract over how they use your attention and data. I want to leave us a few minutes for Q&A, so if, if folks do have questions, please do get them down, and, and someone should be around to collect those uh, cards. Um, and I was, so I want to just do a quick lightning round with everyone. Um, so we started here with talking about deep web technologies, because as I said, I think this is a, a particularly exciting area for some of these challenges to centralization. And, and one of the areas where we're seeing that centralization is one of the other technologies that we're talking about here today, the elephant in the room in some sense, which is artificial intelligence. Um, and so even though this is the D-Web panel, I want to give everyone a chance for their, their AI takes, right? So um, maybe we start with Rachel and, and go down, and I'd love to hear um, just some thoughts on, the, on how decentralization and these technologies can relate into artificial intelligence for us. Uh, sure. So um, I think that decentralized storage is key for AI growth and adoption. Data, obviously, is the fuel of, of AI, um, but you need to be able to track those data sets. Yeah. I don't, I'm, there's this like old saying in AI where the garbage in is garbage out. So like what the models that you get are only as good as the data that you put into them. But nobody, who's thinking about that data that goes into them? Who's tracking how that data changes over time and then how that uh, affects the outputs coming out over time? How do you make sure that that data is verified, is guaranteed, is robust? These are full data sets. So I think that there are, again, not that everything in the world comes back to storage, but in my world it does. So, uh, this is a moment where I think that like the centralized storage, open source technologies like BioFight play a really key role in AI um, and making sure that you can verify the data sets and making sure you can verify the outcomes. So I'm excited. Happy to talk to anybody about that afterwards. Um, okay, so I have a couple of different things to say. First, I think we talked too much about AI. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the thing that strikes me around all of this is consent. And it, it's not, it comes down to that most of what's been taken as consent was not consent to the way our data has been used uh, in the past 20 years. And because we signed one agreement, then it kind of under the core of it, they changed the rules and they, we then said, okay, I agree because I still want to be able to use Google Docs that, so I know I agree to this one. This, we, know, we know that one out of a thousand people read the terms of service on any of the things that we use. We have not given consent is the issue, and nobody's really addressed that from an IP perspective. We have not given consent. We, cannot, we can't treat the check the box that we've been doing as consent and, and because we've proven that it isn't, it isn't real. So I think that's a massive problem right now to the existing forms uh, that have been created in the large language models. But I think going forward, as we start thinking about what, what do we want, do we want the ease of use? Well, guess what? Ease of use can actually get better through a consent-based distributed uh, AI model that is learning you because it's using your data and it's using it locally and at the source. I think those are important things that are still in the early days of evolving. Um, I think they're interesting, but I'm worried about them because they're actually built on top of the models that were built without consent. So I think we need to start thinking about what are we going to do about what's already happened so that we can actually do the innovations that are still to come. So, yeah, the, the interesting thing I think is all the focus on AI has been on these large language models, the, the big foundation models that are very centralized, there's just like five companies doing major work. But there's also emerging, and, and I don't want to be, you know, saying everything is middleware, but personal AI agents are emerging as a thing. Uh, there's an interesting presentation on it at clea.net that I think I have linked to in my document. But the idea is, have your AI call my AI, that you know, you shouldn't have to be dealing with chat GPT and worry about what data it's using and where your data is going and all that kind of thing. You have a personal AI agent and it 
deals with these other AI agents. And people are starting to think about that. And Apple's recent announcement actually has elements of it, where on your phone is a small language model, and things process on your phone where it's private. The problem is it's still controlled by Apple. And Apple's deciding what it shares with the cloud AI. Uh, and it asks you, when the authority pointed out that it gets to be annoying when it asks you. So you really need a personal AI agent that learns what your preferences are about what you share, what you don't share, and what you want to keep private. And it interfaces with these other AI models to work for you to make it a system that works. And it's, so you build legitimacy by having agency. And that, so that's the distribution <coughs> has to have in the future. Uh, and even though there's lots of economies of scale and centralization and such to make the stuff work, you can still layer distributed control into that. Great. I, this is a, a great transition, because this is such an exciting use case to me. It's a great transition to one of these questions that we have here, and I hope we have time for one or two of these. Um, so um, Often decentralized web and blockchain discussions focus on cryptocurrency, and I think when people typically think of that, they're often thinking of like arbitrage and, and financial kind of like uh, um, schemes related to cryptocurrency. So um, this question is asking the panelists to discuss some non-crypto examples of real-lived positive impacts of D-Web, DAO, blockchain technology that we can see today, and I think we've heard a, a bunch of that from folks, but I wonder if we could just take a few minutes to like make that real in terms of use cases. I think you just started doing that. Way. Um, but yeah, let's start with you and then we'll go down. Yeah. Um, middleware, in, in, as it was, is generally talked about, does not require any use of crypto or, or blockchain, but, it, but that is an enabling technology that could be used to make middleware more effective. So it, it's sort of, I think the high level concept is agnostic as to that lower level technology. There was something else that we had to do. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give a good example. So, right now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the, you know, the carbon markets and how we're supposed to be buying all of these tokens that we don't know, or not tokens or whatever, um, credits. Oh, sorry, I'm using using the wrong terms. Um, for for carbon because we're trying to fix our problem <laughs> that we had a little too too much use of of these things in the world. So, but we've also know that they're not believable, right? We've seen the reports. Uh, people say they're growing trees while they're growing spindle trees. They're not sequestering any carbon. Um, and they're not really worth, you know, the, the, even the processing we're going through on it. The thing is, is there are ways to do this. Valid data, it, you need chains of control and validity going all the way from source to the people who are using it. And a good example of this is there's a project right now that's a, it's an early stage project, and I think I want to talk about it a little bit because it's a great um, example of how policy and emerging tech really work well together. Up in Canada, there's a project called Oxala. It is, they, they, they are um, using native forest lands to create sequestering of carbon, and what they did was they had to first go to the government and spend two years changing the policy to allow them not only to have rights to extract, but to have rights to conserve. That was the starting point, because that is the beginning of the asset on the balance sheet. And so, and you can't keep an extraction right if you don't log, and this is true for many forests, by the way, so you have all these rights to do something with land that could be a carbon sink, but that you can't actually do it because you have logging rights that have to be managed. So first they changed the policy. So now you have the option to have extraction or preservation of the natural forest. So that now they have that, they've got investment into that, and they're actually tokenizing to be able to create an ongoing regenerative carbon token that can actually be backed. But then you have the secondary issue, which is proof. So what do you do? You put sensors throughout your forts. You actually go to the source. Those sensors need to work in remote areas. They need to be able 
to be cryptographically signed so that the data that they're, they're gathering, whether it's the soil, whether it's pictures of the environment, whether it's the secondary positive effects like having more wildlife diversity that we're looking for, all of those things need to be captured. They need to be signed into something that can be then validated all the way through essentially a value flow up to the point where the token is being generated and the token, you from the purchase of your token, you can actually come back and see it. This is what's possible with distributed technology. You can't do this with a centralized tech because you can't actually keep those sensors signing as agents from the point of entry into the flow. This is true for every, every form of supply chain that we do today. We need to be using distributed tech and supply chains. We need to be having proof come through our, these, these supply chains because that's going to be the way that we meet regulatory demand, but it's also the way we meet consumer demand. One more, one more example. I love that. Uh, so um, we are thinking a lot about communications and space. And um, another technology that was built at, at part of, developed at Protocol Labs and is now open source, decentralized, peer to peer, anyone can build with it is called IPFS. Interplanetary files. And they built this, they started working on this a decade ago, um, and it's finally used today in space. So uh, we are working with Lockheed Martin Space to put IPFS into space. What does that mean? It means uh, the way the current internet is architected, when you're trying to um, pull information from the server, you have to have, you know, your computer sends out like an HTTP message, it goes to a central server, it retrieves that information. That system is not going to work as we move into outer space because the delays are going to be astronomical. Uh, so uh, IPFS, an interplanetary file system, uh, addresses content by what it is, not where it is, not go to this server, but give me a copy of this document that I'm looking for. And that is a much more scalable alternative for communication in space. So um, a very exciting project that's something that we love talking about that makes me personally excited is starting to build this communication infrastructure in space. So we, we successfully tested this technology in November, where we sent information back and forth between satellites and Earth uh, using IPFS, and it worked. And uh, we're sort of excited to see where that goes as we see more in you know, DC and beyond, you're seeing more organizations like focus up rather than out. Great. Um, we have time for just one more, if we can go really quick through, but I think it's a great one which is, um, and, and Richard, you started to talk about this a little bit earlier. Um, so this question was, adoption of decentralized networks is a seemingly radical shift from what end users are used to today. So what is the path to bring awareness to the benefits of decentralized technology? And I would say more generally, like, how do we drive adoption? And we're talking about this in terms of, these need to be things that are, that are easy to use. You can just, yeah. Yeah, and so this is something we were talking about that stage before we came on. I'm doing, we're doing this audit at all of our social media platforms and seeing sort of what's performing well. And of course, we have, an, we have a uh, handle on X, but also we have a handle on Mastodon and on Threads and on Blue Sky, which are, those are three alter, decentralized open source alternatives, right? And I was asking our social team sort of, how are they doing? And the answer is, no one's, no, no engagement on this platform. So I, I really think it's incumbent upon us as users of the technology, like, to stop doing the thing we keep doing, which is, Use the easy, take the easy path. The easy path is X, right? We're all used to it, it's very comfortable. But there are these alternatives that are easy to use. You just have to like take the step to open that app first to post your announcement, your news, your, your question. And so um, I think adoption, you know, the tech is there. We just need the users. Uh, and the tech is pretty easy to use in some cases. So like this is my call out to you all is to reopen that Threads app or Blue Sky or whatever you're using and, and try to make that your own. I think this is a slow change. Culture, it's a cultural change. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think that there are a lot of indicators that this is something people want. Uh, there are, is more and more demand for things that are privacy first oriented. oriented. Um, there are phones that are coming out that are Android sans Google that are adopting some of the distributed technologies for the applications that run on those phones. There are people buying those. There are more people buying those this year than there were the year before than there were the year before. It's slow, 
the it, 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 what what we need to ensure is that there continues to be funding sources for the innovations that are happening in these spaces. That's actually critical, whether that's coming from some of the foundations, but also that that's coming through the research spaces and the credibility spaces that are forwarded by a lot of public dollars here and everywhere in the world. I think that's critical. But I do think usability is fundamental. And then I don't mean just consumer usability, that's important, but there's other use cases that we just have to get usable and credible projects for. Richard, you want to close this out with some thoughts on, on adoption and usability and things like this? Yeah, I think that this, this structure of layers of distribution is, is what can basically solve the problem. Because if you think about it, an internet browser is, is a, it's a user agent. It's called a user agent. It's a kind of middleware that sits between you and websites. It used to be the internet was this horrible thing that was very difficult to access. And then browsers developed and they started bringing in more and more protocols and more and more ways, you know, video and images and sound. And so you can click from a movie to a, a cast to pictures of the cast to diaries to, you know, hyperlinking is an amazing thing. And so by building layers of strut uh, in social media, all these different things with feeds, um, it's hard to pick, you know, all the details of your feed. But then you can have higher level services that do the curation and bring in some, some of these lower level things so that you have uh, 